Good morning. It is 10.33 a.m. on Sunday, July 9th, 2017. I'm Christiana Ellis, and I just got up. This is five more minutes, and it's Sunday, which means it's time to continue our rewatch of Avatar, The Last Airbender. We have now made our way to Season 3, Episode 6, The Avatar and the Fire Lord. Uh, we get some big deal uh, past exposition in this episode a excellent reveal for Zuko in particular that is extremely well handled I think we have to just admire the storytelling prowess on display with the, dis the demonstration of that new information and how we come to get it and all that I think is just a it's, a it's a mark of expert storytelling but we also get some very important perspective on how the war started which will come into play in a big way when we get to the end of the series uh, no spoilers because uh, I know uh, some of you may have not watched this until you're watching along with me or maybe you're actually just listening to these and not even watching the series which I mean that's allowed you're able to do whatever you want really I have no control but I would recommend you watch it. Anyway, we start this episode with uh, Aang being visited by Avatar Roku in a dream, telling him to go to this his home island on the summer solstice, which is kind of like the last time Aang got to... Well, okay, the last time... And got to talk to Avatar Roku in a brief way was when he was, you know, running away. He was in the ocean. And he was going to try to do everything by himself. But we do recall him going to the fire temple on the winter solstice. And that's when he learned about Sozin's comet and the need to stop the Fire Lord before then. Which is all very neatly, symmetrically tied to where we are now, right? Where we're learning more about, well, okay, who was Sozin? And why is the comet a big deal? How would Roku know that? And why it's important? And so, at the same time, and told in parallel in a very neat way, Zuko finds that someone has left a scroll outside his his room and it's interesting that we're not we actually don't get confirmation but I think we're meant to assume that it's it's uh, Iroh able to escape from his cell and then return to it uh, and yet we don't get explicit confirmation of that which is interesting I'm not sure I think it's partly to preserve the mystery and I don't begrudge it that in the slightest given how well everything turns out and yet how are we supposed to assume that it's anybody else? It doesn't seem like the only other explanation, I think, it's clearly sent by Iroh, so the only other explanation is that maybe he bribed a guard to do it? And if that's the case, then, I mean, they could tell us that. I don't know. I'm not sure why it matters. Given the last that we saw of Iroh was the reveal that he had been secretly training himself to be super buff uh, while in prison, even though he's maintaining this appearance of being a frail old man, suggests to me that he's got all sorts of hidden tricks up his sleeve, that he, uh, it makes sense that he would be able to get out of his cell and then return to it, which is an interesting thing, because of course, one could reasonably reasonably ask the question separate from knowing the characters. Well, if he can escape, why doesn't he? Well, the answer is because Zuko's still there. I think that's obvious. In any event, the scroll that Zuko gets tells him that he needs to find out about his great-grandfather's death. Naturally, he assumes that this great-grandfather in question is Fire Lord Sozin, his great-grandfather. And there's a conversation with uh, him and Azula where it's a little bit of an as-you-know-Bob sort of thing where she's like, didn't you pay attention in history class, blah, blah, blah. 
but at the same time, I think it's in character because we can imagine that Azula is the one of the two who seems like she would be more interested in knowing how past conquerors did their thing. Whereas Zuko, I think even probably before his, his becoming disgraced and exiled and all of that, was a little more self-absorbed. He's kind of a little more sensitive and in his head. Whereas I think Azula would be a little bit more excited to learn about past wars and stuff. In any event, she says, yeah, he started the war. He was very clever. He used the comet to his advantage. But as for his death, which is specifically what the scroll asks about, oh, it was boring. He died very old, in his sleep, successful. So that seems strange, right? And we're thinking, well, that doesn't seem like it can possibly be what the scroll is telling Zuko to find. So we're right there with Zuko in assuming there must be more to it. That can't be the real story, right? We've got to find out what really happened. And then sure enough, turns out, uh, Zuko finds out by kind of accident that there's a secret message on the scroll revealed by the heat of the lantern, uh, which is a very Fire Nation sort of trick. And uh, it tells him to go to the Dragonbone Catacombs to find the secret history. Ooh. And it's fun that we have to, you know, we see a bit more of these sorts of bending locks that we've previously seen <clears throat> in some, like the Air Temple and the Fire Temple previously. Uh, it, it occurs to me to wonder, though, that enough people are able, like, there's enough firebenders in the Fire Nation. Do they really want it to be accessible to just any of them, or is there more to it, I wonder? It's maybe a detail that's not worth uh, belaboring, because it would slow down the narrative momentum. In any case, Zuko suspects that he is looking for secret information that is going to help reveal this mystery. And his assumption that he's not allowed to do this, like he might get in trouble if he does. And I think that is revealing, right? Because he's got to be, we, we already know from the beach episode that he's feeling conflicted. He is looking for answers. He doesn't understand his own feelings about what's going on with him right now. And the idea that there's secret information that he's not been told, he very readily believes, first of all, that this secret information probably does exist. Because even as Azula tells him, you know, oh yeah, Sheldon died in his bed of old age. Zuko's immediately thinking, that can't be right. That can't be it. This secret has got to be right. So he's very ready to believe it, and he's ready to believe that it's something that would he could potentially get in trouble for seeking out, but that he's willing to do anyway. And I think that that is a very nice way of showing his conflict and his readiness to find out that there's something for him besides this current life that he's found himself in that he's finding so unsatisfying. In any event, he sneaks down and finds the final testament of Fire Lord Sozin. And we get this, you know, this, this reveals not necessarily a huge deal, but it's kind of a nice coincidence. It feels good to learn that Sozin and um, Fire Lord, or excuse me, Avatar Roku, pre-learning that he's the Avatar. Best friends have the same birthday, celebrate it together, do everything together, have a very friendly, but, you know, with just a pinch of competition uh, to their relationship. And this ties into what Aang's insight will be later, but just this discovery that, like, they're both very much Fire Nation guys, you know, uh, Roku, at this point, did not display any kind of uh, 
you know, quality about him that suggested that he doesn't like the Fire Nation or he's not really part of the Fire Nation. And so they, you know, they're best friends until the 16th birthday, at which point the monks, uh, the, the fire sages come and let Roku know that he's actually the avatar. And we see that a after a moment of hesitation, even Sozin does kneel to him. And this indicates that at least at first, uh, he's not overcome by jealousy or anything. Like that doesn't seem to be the problem. We could imagine in a slightly more facile version of the story that that is what so gets under Sozin's skin, is that like he's jealous of Roku being the avatar. And yet that's kind of not how it plays. We see, first of all, it's interesting to note Roku being told he's the avatar at 16, because we recall that Aang was told four years early because the war was going on and the monks were worried at that time that the avatar might be needed sooner. And so they told him younger, which j the, the whole story has this, this fantastical chain of events quality to it that you can't help but wonder is like, so Aang, because he was told too young, wasn't able to handle it, which led to him running away, which led to him getting frozen which all sounds bad, except that we also now learn that the Fire Nation, once everything was going bad, specifically targeted the Air Nomads for extinction in order explicitly to try to cut off the, you know, the new Avatar and to dest destroy him. And they missed him because he was frozen on the ocean. And that's interesting because it, it produces this quality that like fate is involved somehow. And yet we don't want to completely suggest that we think it was good that Aang ran away. And yet it was fated to be part of his journey, perhaps. It's an interesting uh, little, you know, caught, you know, trial and error to, uh, imagine. Like if we wanted to do like a, what if story, what if Aang had, if they had waited to tell him until he was 16. In any event, we see though that Roku, like Aang, also has some trouble dealing with it, but a little bit less. Uh, there's a, a notion that he, He's been told by the monks, it's like, I was packing, but then they told me that I don't need earthly possessions anymore. And that's kind of a weird thing to be told. And it's just this reflection of how much his life is about to change. And it's his buddy Sozin that, you know, comforts him and basically says, hey, you know, you, you got this. Here, I want to I want to give you this, this hair on ornament that's supposed to be worn by the crown prince, but I'm going to give it to you. These guys are good friends at this point, and it's not a jealous thing, which is kind of nice, just because, again, that seems like it would be sort of the obvious but mer less interesting way to take it. And then so we get the training montage. We have uh, uh, everyone going to the, uh, you know, you know we, we, we have... Mutually, Zuko learning about this from the testament of Sozin, Aang seeing it from the spirit world. Uh, and we also, I think this is about the bit where we, we have the nice little moment of humor with Katara, Toph, and Sokka observing Aang doing a little bit of uh, sleepwalking equivalent, only uh, the various motions that he's doing. Um, uh, they they prompts the question, are there bathrooms in the spirit world? <laughs> and it's funny too, just because Sokka immediately points out that there is not. And we recall that he, we remember that he was pulled into the spirit world by the big panda spirit for a while. So he would know. In any case, we get to see another fun coincidence that 
when he was learning airbending, Roku trained with Gyatsu, uh, who was as young as he was at that time. And that's kind of uh, where we get this idea, friendships can transcend lifetimes. And that's a nice idea. We see him learn water bending, and there's a, an element where we imagine that the, the coincides with what we've learned already, that the element that is most opposed to the element of an avatar's birth is the most difficult for them to learn. Just like it was very difficult for Aang to learn earth bending, it was difficult for Roku to learn fire bending, or excuse me, water bending. And in that training we so and we also see him uh, mastering earth bending as well and once he is uh, trained for 12 years he finally returns to the fire nation and there's a little bit of a question like oh well you know Sozin is fire lord now and he, you know they're both grown-ups they're not the the boys they were before what's it going to be like there's a little bit of a foreshadowing of, like, when my subjects greet me, they typically bow. But you're the exception. And then they hug. And, and it seems like, oh, yeah, great. They're still friends. And they are still friends. And that's, again, what's interesting that it kind of continues to maintain this. We're, we're primed because we know the outcome to say, well, they're going to become enemies, right? So we keep expecting it, and it keeps not happening yet. But we have Roku finally marrying the, you know, the his childhood crush, uh, and a weird little bit of a nod of like, oh, being the Avatar helps you with the ladies. Um, actually, and that just, okay, there's, there's no way to discuss it without spoilers, but it does make me think of something related to uh, Legend of Korra. Anyway, which is, again, if you're not familiar, is the sequel series to this one. But at the wedding, this is where Sozin brings up something he's clearly been thinking about for a long time. And it is the first real hint of the division between them. And it's basically global conquest presented as though it's entirely a positive thing. And it has some historical precedent, but this basic idea is, oh, hey, Roku, this is me as uh, Sozin here. We are experiencing unprecedented wealth and happiness and peace in the Fire Nation right now. Wouldn't it be great if we could spread that to the rest of the world? And the thing is, when you say it like that, it sounds great, but what Roku instinctively knows is that, it's a couple of things. One is that there's a tradition aspect of it that is kind of a little bit more unsatisfying, the idea that, oh no, the four nations are supposed to be separate. They're supposed to be separate. And see, that answer and that's the reason he gives Sozin, is not satisfying to Sozin, and honestly, it's not satisfying to us. That's like, it's, oh, it's because it's the rules? Like, why? That, why is that a rule? Why does it have to be separate? Like, that doesn't make sense. And in fact, actually, as the, uh, you know, as the sequel series Legend of Korra kind of points out, is like, maybe it doesn't really need to be that way. And, but that's the reason that Roku gives. But like the real reason that he kind of doesn't want to get into because it would make him think badly of his friend is the, the unspoken piece of what he's proposing is we're going to share our wealth with the other nations, whether they want us to or not. And if they try to stop us, we will kill them. That doesn't sound very nice, does it? And so Roku basically just says, no, I don't like that. It's against the rules. Don't talk to me about this anymore. I don't want to hear anything more about it, is what he says. But this ties into what Roku previously told Aang, which is that he felt like there might have been more that he could have done. 
to stop the war. He didn't recognize in time. And sure enough, I think this is an example where the division perhaps worsens and things progress more because they're friends. Because they're friends, Roku basically just cuts off the discussion and, and tells Sozin, like, don't talk to me about this. But what we learn is, of course, Sozin doesn't stop thinking about it. He just stops telling his friend what's going on. And so sure enough, uh, you know, we see uh, kind of a lot of time jumps at this point uh, that Roku, you know, is doing his work as the Avatar, but then he discovers that Sozin has invaded an Earth Kingdom colony and had a big battle and conquered conquered it. And this is obviously in direct conflict with uh, uh, not only what Roku had told him before, but also his duty as the Avatar. And he's feeling now, it's like, he, you're, you are putting me in this difficult position of having to be harsh with you, but this is like, this is, you know, I was going to say, this is my job, man. I'm the Avatar. i got to do this stuff. But the, the, the deeper element is just this idea of, it, it feels like a betrayal, but even still there's this element of, element, <laughs> he, stops this he, he they actually have their first real fight but because roku is the avatar basically he just uses the avatar state to blow up this whole little palace and specifically tells roku for the sake of our former friendship i won't do anything more than this but you watch yourself and sparing his life for the sake of his former friendship, their former friendship. And again, this is another perfect example of the chain of events that we talked about with Aang in the sense that it wasn't necessarily a good thing in the moral sense that he ran away. But the fact that he ran away saved his life. And who knows how much else... Uh, saved by virtue of him being spared. And by contrast, it doesn't necessarily feel right that Roku should have killed Sozin in that moment. You know, having, you know, rendered him helpless, does it feel like something that the Avatar should have done is to just kill him there? That doesn't feel right either. And yet, because he's left alive, we see what happens. And so, sure enough, you know, they, uh, they, they each have now gone their separate ways. And Sozin has recognized, you know what, uh, obviously, if the Avatar is not going to let me do my conquest, then I have to just forget about it. But then years later, now they're both old men, and the volcano on on Roku's home island is erupting and you know th this this might be one of the only points of like ambiguity that maybe could have been a little bit stronger uh is the this really identifying definitively that the volcanic eruption was just a thing like it was just it just happened it wasn't caused by someone or something for some reason it was just a natural occurrence. But I think that there's this implication when we first see the scene of Sozin sensing the eruption from all that distance away. There's a moment at first I had where, like, it's like, oh, is he causing it? Seems unlikely. We, we have not been given the indication that he is that powerful. But there's a moment of confusion there that I think I'm, I'm not sure what they should have done to uh, do that differently, but we see Roku now desperate to preserve his Island. And it's interesting because it's a question of some of what 
Aang has had to learn recently, like towards the end of season two, this idea of is it worth the Avatar's life to protect the island once all the people have gotten away? Because the implication that we get is that he helps everyone to evacuate and then he is staying to try to save the island, which is, you know, admirable. But is he doing that? Is he risking himself out of attachment? And should he? That's not the main thrust of the scene, but it's an interesting thing to consider, I think. And so he is doing his best, but it's a volcano. And even a, even the Avatar is is struggling to try to contain a whole volcano. And so we see Sozin, his first instinct is to come and help his friend. And I think this this is again where the like the ambiguity trips us up just a little bit of uh why why is he coming to help only then to do what he does later? And I think it's the it's the only part that maybe could have been a little bit clearer in this episode. That tying in with what we learn for Zuko later in the sense that every person has the capability for good and evil in them. And we see both here from Sosen. What we see first is my old friend is in trouble. I gotta go help him. And he does. He goes and he helps. But it's only when he is tempted that he gives in and chooses the, the dark path where he discovers that the two of them together have worked to try to protect uh, this protect this island. But then when so, uh, Roku is overcome by the fumes, Sozin suddenly re realizes, if I let you die, I can continue my war. And he does. And so it's, you know, and it's interesting too that what we see is from the perspective of Roku, I, I think I suspect this is a narrative conceit rather than a world building detail. The idea that literally Roku closes his eyes and then opens them again as baby Aang, because we've, we know that Aang does not just have Roku's memories. It's not as if he's just swapped bodies. He is a different person. He's just still the avatar. But at the same time, just suggesting that it's an instant transference and making it clear, I think, up to us that that's what's happening. Uh, one additional little detail that's interesting to think about is the dragons. Because, you know, Roku had a dragon, and then Sozin also had a blue dragon. Uh, so where are all the dragons? Hmm. In any case, this is the death of Avatar Roku. We had, we had wondered, right? Because all we knew, all everybody knew, was that the Avatar had disappeared. I mean, that's in the, the opening credits. He disappeared. No one knew what happened. Now we know betrayed by his oldest friend. And we can't help but wonder too, it's like, well, without that duality, like if Sozin had not come to help, you know, the island might, you know, what we, what might have happened is that Roku might have eventually given up the island as a lost cause and evacuated himself, maybe. But that's not what happened. So now we have Zuko saying, well, wait, this doesn't tell me about the death of Sozin either. What is going on? And so this is where we get this amazing reveal where he goes and he confronts Iroh because he, he suspects, as we did, that it's Iroh's doing that he got this scroll. And it's all of the assumptions that Zuko makes here, I think, are what tell us without having to beat us over the head with it, how ready Zuko is to hear something that will allow him to choose the path that he knows is right in his heart. He can't reconcile what feels right in his heart with what he's always believed to be right in his head. And so he is desperate now for something that will let him reconcile those things. 
And unfortunately for him, what Iroh gives him is the reveal that there will always be a conflict. You have both of these things in you and you cannot, you cannot just be one or the other. But he, he has these things in him presented very literally because it's like, but I didn't learn about the death of my great grandfather. And it's like, yes, you did because Roku was your mother's grandfather. And given everything that we know about Zuko up to this point, this is just, this is an earth shattering revelation because so much of the Fire Nation dynasty here is predicated on this idea of, you know, your heritage and your, what's in your blood and that sort of thing. And this idea of having to live up to your father's expectations and everything. But to realize that your mother's side of the family tree can be just as important. And that this makes Roku or, you know, this makes Zuko spiritually related in a way to the Avatar, to Aang. And this idea of does he have to be like his father because it's his father? Well... What if he chose the other way? But for Iroh to not make it an easy thing, right? Like, not just going to say, this is what's going to flip the switch for you. You have both of these things in you. And you don't get to just pick one. But you have to work at it. It's also interesting that this is finally the first time in Season 3 that Iroh has spoken and it is because, you know, or I don't want to say because, it is with the new voice actor because the voice actor that played Iroh in seasons one and two died, unfortunately. We talked about that when we were uh, in the middle of last season. And uh, apparently in the DVD commentary, the creators say that it was always the intention to have Iroh not speak for the first several episodes of season three. So it doesn't seem like it was a choice made because of that. Uh, element, but at the same time, I think it works nicely there, that it gives us some space. Probably helps a little bit that it's been a while now since we last heard the other voice actor, so we don't necessarily notice the difference as much, maybe. But in any case, the, the new voice actor does fine, but it's it, I think it is different if you're listening for it. But in any case, Iroh reveals that he has this same royal uh, uh, headpiece and telling him that you are the one that has the power to redeem this family. And likewise, we have Aang back at the island with his, his friends telling them the story in the same way. And there's there's a tendency in immediately for everyone else to fixate on the betrayal part. But Aang narrow, zeroes in on this idea that, no, it's more complicated than that. Because they were friends. Roku was a Fire Nation person. He was not... We, we This tendency for us to think of the Fire Nation as the bad guys... We need to really just try to stop doing that and to reveal that even the bad guy, the guy who started the war, the guy who let Roku die, the guy who ordered the extermination of the air nomads, even he had good in him. And he chose wrong, but it was there. And to this idea to treat everyone as though there's still a chance that they, you could give them a chance for redemption. And I think that that's, you know, that's a very important insight for Aang to have moving forward. And then we also get the nice moment of discussing whether or not can friendships really transcend lifetimes? And they kind of all hold hands to kind of hope that it can. And Sokka is initially skeptical, is like, 
well, there's not really any scientific evidence for why that would be. But then he takes their hand anyway. And it's nice. It's a nice moment to end on. And so this is a great episode with some real powerful backstory, you know, solving some mysteries that we had all, we'd wondered really since the beginning. Like the very first episode says, you know, the Avatar disappeared. Why? Now we know. But also this reveal of a crucial detail that we wonder if if it might be finally what is able to help Zuko overcome the conflict he's been feeling and make better decisions. Maybe. In any event, uh, we will be back next week to talk about Season 3, Episode 7, The Runaway. And I will talk to you guys tomorrow for five more minutes.